Now, high performance is possible. We can certainly deliver performance. But actually, today, the performance is you know, one aspect. But actually, there's another very critical issue that's facing the designers of HPC systems, which is the amount of energy that these machines consume. And that the amount of energy these systems are consuming has been going up regularly for, uh, for as long as I've, I've been in this business. And if you are a manager of a data center, on the one side, you want to be able to deliver to your customers what they need. But you, as the manager of the data center, also need to manage your costs. How much energy does it cost to operate the machine? How large a machine is it? Um, how, how much air conditioning you're going to need? How much floor space you're going to need? These are all critical issues now for the people who are operating data centers. And what I want to talk about is the sorts of computer architectures that can be of benefit, that, that show advantage and uh, benefits in terms of not just providing uh, arithmetic capability, computational capability, but also can deliver that performance in a as efficiently as possible in terms of volume, space, energy consumption, air conditioning requirements, and so on. So let's think a little bit about the problem of power. So there are four, uh, no, one, two, three, six, six rather different sorts of computers up there. So they range on the far left, a mobile phone, um, what else have we got, a tablet, um, a gaming console, a laptop, a PC, and a, server, a cluster for a server. And these may all look very different machines, but in fact they ha all have one thing in common. And the one thing they have in common is that they're all power-constrained machines. So I travel around a lot, and I travel, I take my telephone with me, and the battery charger, because inevitably the battery isn't good enough to last for the whole of my trip. And I take my laptop, which has a heavy battery in it, but I can't just carry the battery. I also have to carry this around with me. So always we are um, dealing with, this, and I've talked about a little bit uh, this, the, about the question of the data center manager. He also has this issue of how can he operate his service and keep his electricity budget under control. And all of these machines uh, have the same real characteristic that they are power constrained machines. So the defense uh, uh, research agency in the US, the United States, looked at the um, challenges that were required to get to what we call exascale com computation. So by exascale computation, I mean something like two to three orders of magnitude far farther on than where we are today. And um, uh, which, uh, when we're expecting to reach that exascale goal, in around about 2018, 2019, maybe 2020. And they identified major challenges, um, and they are listed up there, but actually the number one challenge, the most important challenge that the uh, DARPA research agency identified in attempting to reach the exascale goal, machines three orders of magnitude larger than what we have today, the major goal to reach that, the major uh, obstacle to reaching that goal is how are we going to be able to reach that performance goal within a reasonable power consumption? So let me explain why this is such a big problem. Now we all know about Moore's law. This is something that's been kept keeping going for uh, decades. In summary, it's uh, Moore's law says, or more, maybe Moore's observation is more uh, accurate, but Moore's law is what we call it, is that the density of transistors on a piece of silicon doubles roughly every uh, 18 months. And so we've got the typical sort of graph here, a number of um, CPU, pic CPU die shots. In fact, the one on the far uh, right is a picture of an NVIDIA GPU. That's a GPU from 2010. We're now in 2012, and the next one on that uh, iteration will have uh, something like 7 billion transistors in it. Uh, that's, these are chips that we're already manufacturing. So Moore's Law is still keeping going. So Moore's Law delivers to us more transistors. And you might think that uh, more transistors delivers more performance. And that's partially true. It's partially true um, because we also have another 
uh, physical law working with us, which is um, Denard scaling. So what Denard scaling tells us is that um, if we were to double the number of chip, double the number of transistors on a chip, so make it, we take a chip and we double its size, so double the number of transistors, we'd get uh, it would take uh, twice the power consumption. But other things help us. So um, we're able to make faster transistors. Typically, in this time, in the same time that we're able to double the density, we're also to make the. It, we're also able to increase the clock frequency by a factor of 1.4. We're also able to make the transistors smaller, so we reduce the amount of capacitance that's in the transistor, and that uh, that so. Making the transistors faster consumes more power. Making them smaller reduces the power consumption. And indeed, if we're able to also reduce the voltage at the same time, we can then complete this path in which we've got uh, 2.8 times the capability of the, in the device for the same power consumption. Now, unfortunately, the bad news is that Denard scaling doesn't work anymore. That worked for many years but it doesn't work anymore. We're now at the situation where still Moore's law delivers to us twice as many transistors, but unfortunately we cannot, uh, we can, we reduce the size of the transistors so we can reduce the um, uh, performance power taken to drive the transistor, but uh, we can't make them any faster and we can't reduce the voltage anymore because the voltage is already at the minimum voltage that the, the transistors work successfully. And so to get back to our, uh, we now got the situation where we've got twice as many transistors, we've made them smaller because we're using a, a finer silicon technology, but we've got more power, we're dissipating more power. And so to get back to the situation where we're operating our chip at the same power, we're only getting 1.4 times the performance. So rather than having uh, 2.8 times the performance, as Moore's law delivers us twice as many transistors, we're only getting 1.4 times the performance, simply because this Denard scaling law has really run out of steam. And what this tells us is if we try to extrapolate how long it will take us to get to exascale computing, it's going to be until, not until 9, 2035 that we can get to exascale computing within a reasonable power, and people think that 20 megawatts is a, a plausible, acceptable power that you're going to, you know, the maximum sort of power budget that's reasonable for working in a data center. Now, because I'm here today, you might guess that actually I'm going to give a slightly better story, which will get us to exascale well before 2035. And that's, the, that's, what, that's what the point of this whole presentation is going to be, that there is an alternative uh, to getting us, that will get us to exascale without having to, um, uh, w using more than what the classical physical scaling laws uh, deliver. And the concept is to use a different, one of, the, well, one of several concepts is to use a different sort of computer architecture, which we call a throughput processor. So we've seen, we see today two rather different and contrasting sorts of computer architectures which have been, and the, the architecture, the details of the architect, architecture are as a consequence of the um, target, the goal for using these machines. So on the uh, right hand side, let's start on the right hand side with the classical microprocessor, the uh, CPU. The goal of a CPU design is to, um, it has a number of cores, where today we're at the level of sort of 8, 12, 16 cores. And the goal of the designer of the CPU is to maximize the performance of the individual thread running on that modest number of cores. Maximize the performance of the individual thread ex of execution. And this is the right thing to do if your goal is to make a machine for uh, running uh, Word and email and running uh, queries in a data center, database queries in a data center, these are, or running a web server, this is exactly the right sort of goal that you should be, that the computer architect should be going for. And it's why Intel is one of the largest companies on the planet, because there's a big demand for this. So we have, uh, we maximize the um, 
the performance of the individual thread, and we're also interested in working in rather modest uh, data set sizes. And so spending a lot of area in the, uh, in the silicon die, I think all of this area, putting a lot of cache memory onto the silicon itself is a, a technique that allows you to maximize the performance of these individual threads working on modest sized data sets because you're hoping that much of the data you want to work on will fit within the cache of the, of the CPU. Now the GPU has been optimized for a completely different approach to computation. So the GPU is a throughput processor. The goal is not to work on modest sized data sets, but to work on large data sets, to stream the data through the, uh, through the GPU, uh, and also to be working in a rather um, uh, in a manner that's very tolerant of memory latency. Now the GPU has a very high throughput, but it's, um, it, there's a typically a very large latency involved in moving data from the external memory into the GPU. But the GPU is very, very well capable of managing that sort of large, uh, large latency. And one of the consequences of the uh, differences in computer architecture is that the amount of energy you spend to execute a single instruction is very different. So the CPU is taking something like uh, 1700 picojoules per instruction, whereas the GPU is taking a much smaller amount, what have got, four, six, something like six times, six, seven times less energy consumption per uh, energy consumption per instruction. So the GPU is a very efficient way of delivering computational power in terms of the energy consumed per instruction. One of the ways it's uh, able to do this is because um, it's, a, it's a SIMD machine. So you issue one instruction and then you use it many times. So at the moment we, we have 32-way SIMD units within the GPU. So you have rather little uh, area within the silicon uh, dedicated to managing the instructions. It's a rather simple processor, so it doesn't do a speculative execution, it doesn't do out-of-order execution, because those are techniques that are very useful for the CPU when you want to maximize the performance of the individual thread. But if you want to get throughput, uh, a rather simple execution model is a much better one. So the GPU architecture designed for doing graphics, that is to say, painting color ultimately painting color little color triangles on your screen, uh, is a very efficient way of, uh, of processing data as well. So if you look at the, um, how we're going to get to the goal of an exaflop, we can, we've got these, uh, the target is this, um, yellow line right at the top, this is an exaflop, but express, expressed in terms of um, ha the performance per watt. So we will need to get something like, uh, looks like about 50, 60, 70, ah, this I've written up there, 50 gigaflops per watt if we want to be able to reach an exascale machine in a reasonable power consumption. And this blue line here shows us the trend that the uh, CPU, the classical CPU architecture is taking, and the green line Tells us the, shows us the trend that the uh, GPU architecture is taking. And what you can see that already today, uh, this slide must be make, made um, last year because it looks like 2011, but what you can see today is that um, already the GPU is, has an advantage in terms of uh, how much power consumption it requires to be able to deliver a certain unit of floating point arithmetic. Even so, you can see that there is still a gap, so by 2016, 2017, 18, we're still perhaps not going to be there, but uh, the GPU gets us, uh, gives us a significant advantage over the classical G CPU architecture. So we're something like now an order of magnitude below what we need to reach the exaflop, and we expect to be able to get there, uh, it says 2016, I suspect it will actually be a little later than that, um, we expect to be able to get there, First of all, by getting an improvement in performance from the process technology, so improving the manufacturing, and then getting a further gain in performance by having better uh, computer architectures. So there's an ever-increasing uh, 
push within NVIDIA to be able to improve the efficiency of the device in terms of power consumption. And what we're, what we're saying now is that if we do follow this uh, route of using GPUs to get to exascale, we will get there in something like the 2019, is it? Yes, 2019 time frame, we are predicting to be able to get to the exascale regime using GPUs as the computer architecture. Sure, please. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. So there are well, there are two. There are two things that you can you want to look at to try and get the benefit. So one is um, the natural evolution. Silicon technology is getting better, and so we can just rely on physics to get us some of that some of that gain. That four, one of those fourfold gains. But the other gain comes from basically you know, human intelligence. We've got to do things better. Um, so, anecdotally, um, NVIDIA has just released a new GPU. Uh, or, well, it'll be formally announced in a few weeks, but it's, it's just about on the cusp of being released. The uh, engineers working on that project woke up every morning and thought about how can I make this device a more power-efficient device. And compared with the previous generation of GPU, it's something like three times more efficient in terms of power consumption. Uh, and there are still plenty of architectural ideas available, so some of this gain is going to come from simply because, by being better at engineering. Than C there, yes. Because... Um, so... Well, let's... Uh, well, uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, I, you know, Intel certainly has clever people. I'm sure they're going to do good stuff as well. But uh, we have, you know, we have a good edge, and we think we're going to maintain that advantage. Yes. Uh, so, uh, certainly, I'm allowed to say. Um, well, I, uh, well, be and because I'm so used to talking, asking questions, I can answer your question and not. Re and if I want to avoid something, I will. I will certainly avoid it. Um, so we will, the way NVIDIA works is we, first of all, design a computer architecture. So this is a somewhat abstract concept. And then from that architecture, we build many products. Okay, so, we, so every two years, we will come out with a new architecture. Um, and the first products, and the, they happen to have code names that are based after famous scientists. So the current, the, the computer architecture is currently called Kepler. There are already a few uh, products have been released based on the Kepler architecture. And uh, within a few weeks, we will release our flagship high-end, all singing, all dancing uh, product based on the Kepler architecture. But there will be a complete range of uh, GPUs from the, you know, the, the, the very high-end, high-performance device and high-power consumption device that goes into servers all the way down to um, uh, devices for mobile computers. So if you are a fan of, of Apple, you can now go out and buy a MacBook with a Kepler GPU in it. So just a little diversion, a little bit away from, uh, onto a, onto a, onto a, a uh, you know, slight, slight tangent here, but still within the general topic of uh, energy efficient computing, I want to just draw your attention to this rather nice product that's just started shipping. Um, it said uh, Q2, but it's actually it's, uh, just, it's just, just started shipping in quantities. And what you'll see on here is, um, first of all, on this, this is a GPU. It happens to be an NVIDIA GPU that's designed to go into a laptop. But it's coupled with um, a, another NVIDIA product called a Tegra. So the Tegra is the device that goes into tablets, uh, smartphones, so if you have a Google Nexus tablet, for example, you would find an, a Tegra, GP, a Tegra SOC within that device. And the uh, processor within uh, this Tegra device is an ARM core. So what we're seeing here is um, coupling two very effective technologies. So a power-efficient uh, CPU core, the 
One, the goal of ARM when designing their, their CPUs is power efficiency. It's one of their major goals. Coupled together with uh, a power efficient um, GPU. So this is a, an interesting development platform you could, might want to look at as a way of doing a very effective um, power efficient computation in a compact device. So I want to talk next about um, an internal research project that NVIDIA has called Echelon, which uh, is our, one of our research projects is trying to push towards developing an exascale machine. So this is a, a long-term project. It's been funded by the, uh, the DARPA research agency in the US. NVIDIA is the prime contractor. And you can see uh, that there are some important names in high performance computing here. So Cray is involved, Oak Ridge National Laboratories, which operates one of the major computing centers in the US. Um, some important universities and um, uh, industrial partners like Lockheed Martin. And the real goal of this project is to work at how can we get a practical uh, high performance computer so that can uh, provide a building block to go into exascale and is also something very practical and usable. So I'll talk a little bit more about the system in detail. Uh, but I first, uh, in a moment, but what I want to do is first of all draw your attention to the uh, basic processor within the, uh, within the concept of the processor within this Echelon project. And what you can see is that there are uh, two sorts of processor to, uh, within, the, within the silicon. Any, any large-scale uh, application that's going to run on these very highly parallel machines is going to have significant amounts of parallelism in it and will execute well on these sorts of highly parallel throughput processors that, uh, that the GPU architecture offers. But of course, no application is 100% parallel. There will be certain parts of your application that are more serial, that have less parallelism in, in them, and therefore we also need to couple these highly parallel throughput processors with a certain number, uh, yet to be determined, but a certain number of um, CPU-like processors. And so the architecture of the future, the, the processor of the future, is likely to be a fusion of, in some quantity, in some ratio, of throughput processors that can deal very effectively with highly parallel workloads and um, CPU-like processors that are appropriate for the less parallel, the less, um, the more sequential parts of your work. I've talked about power, and I, I think it's, it's something that we need. I think it's, uh, it's a point that is really critical to the whole design of computer architecture these days. This is the one topic that all computer architects are thinking about um, at length. And the point is, the key issue is that moving data is the problem. Moving data costs a lot of energy. And so what you want to do in designing a, a machine is to minimize the amount of data movement, and optimize the storage hierarchy within your chip so as to move data as little as possible. So here are uh, some interesting sort of data points to show you just how uh, much energy it takes to, to move data around. What is the point, what is the, where, where do you spend energy within a device? So these are, these are numbers that come from the 28 nanometer silicon technology. So let's imagine we had a, a piece of silicon that's uh, 20 millimeters on a side. And if we wished to multiply two numbers together, it would cost us about 20 picojoules. If we wanted to uh, write that data back to memory, it's already going to cost us um, twice as much energy. If we want to move that data to another part of the chip, then it's going to cost us yet another, well, by the time, we, if you want to move the data across the whole chip, it's going to cost us, uh, what's that, 50 times as much energy. So if you want, if you do a sum, if you do a computation, you really want to try and consume the output from that computation as close as possible on the chip. So we've already got a factor of 50 compared with uh, creating some data, compared with moving it across the chip. And if we want to move it off chip, it's already going. It's now going to cost us um, uh, even more energy again. Uh, so, well, half a picojoule will move that data off chip. 
So moving data off chip is a very, very expensive operation. So the, the, the real goal it, when you're designing these and using all of these devices is to try and consume the data where it's going to, where it's being produced. And for some sorts of applications, that's very easy. They have this um, hierarchical um, use of the data in which much of the data is uh, not moved and kept uh, very local to where it's uh, generated. Whereas, um, so this is a, uh, just a look at um, cache misses as a reasonable measure of um, how local the data is to your, uh, to, you, to where it's generated. And if you had a, um, an algorithm, uh, an application that had this sort of data production and consumption, then the sort of architecture that would work very well for you would be a very deep uh, cache hierarchy of, of a very deep hierarchy of caches. That would work very efficiently for you because mostly you'd be consuming data from the L1 cache, so very little the, the L1 cache can be close to where the processing is done. And occasionally you'd need to go further up the hierarchy of the tree. Um, so occasionally you'd be moving data larger and larger distances. But unfortunately, not all applications are like that. So many applications uh, don't work very well with these very deep, don't have this pattern of data access, don't fit very well with a deep hierarchy of caches, and have plateaus in their working sets. And the right way to deal with a, an application with a shallow hierarchy would be to have a very um, a shallow cache hierarchy. So just maybe two levels of cache. So what you rather want to be able to do is to have a, um, a chip that can reconfigure itself so that the structure of the uh, memory system within the chip can be reconfigured according to the type of uh, application that you have. And so one way to do this is to have a network on the chip so that it can rearrange the structure of the memory to suit the uh, application itself. So you might uh, have on the left-hand side the physical layout in which you've got um, processors, local caches, and memories, and then a network on the chip that is controlling the structure of the memory and how the uh, pieces of the memory fit together into a hierarchy. And you can reconfigure that, uh, using that switch, you can reconfigure the memory hierarchy according to the sorts of applications you're going to use, and then get the right, the best uh, memory consumption out of the, uh, sorry, power consumption out of the device. And so a, this is a sort of a, a notional floor plan of the sort of chip that you might have for, uh, that we might develop within the Echelon, Echelon project. We'd have this basic building block consisting of these throughput optimized cores, um, which are the, the, the GPU-like cores. We'd have uh, latency optimized cores. Uh, where are they on the device? Um, can't quite see where they're. They must be on here somewhere. Uh, but we have these, so a combination of throughput cores, GPU-like cores on the chip, and CPU-like cores via less parallel part of the chip. Uh, and then this network on the chip and the controller that uh, can rearrange and restructure the memory embedded within the silicon so as to give the right sort of structure for fitting your application. And so we can come up with a, a sort of a notional design of the sort of um, computer architecture that would be appropriate for an exascale machine. So first of all, we have at the lowest level, we would have this... Um, multi-lane device, so multiple floating point units and the registers, so we, together that might be able to deliver to us something like 20 gigaflops of uh, performance. And then we would couple those, um, those together to make a, um, a streaming multiprocessor, so something like you know, a throughput processor that's streaming data from memory through these highly parallel processors. So eight of those coupled together with an L1 cache and a switch might deliver something like 160 gigaflops of performance. We could then start coupling these together um, to make the, the chip itself. And the, um, the chip itself is, uh, so, the, yes, so the chip, the processing chip itself will contain the streaming multiprocessors, the, so the GPU-like processors, the uh, 
CP log processors, our network that's connecting to the embedded SRAM on the silicon, and also we'd have things like the um, network interface and um, the memory controller here. So the tendency now today is that more and more things are going to be integrated onto the silicon itself. We're getting more and more transistors, so rather than having separate devices that are memory controllers, separate devices that are network, network interfaces, everything is going to be integrated onto the single chip. And then uh, we'll take these um, uh, <coughs> We'll take these and take the processor cell, processor's chip and then perhaps put some stacked DRAM around it. So the next generation of technology for, for memory technology for performance is um, uh, to have perhaps a, what we call a silicon interposer. So we have a silicon substrate. We place the, um, the processor in the silicon substrate and then surround that uh, silicon sub surround the GPU, sorry, the processor itself with stacked memory so that rather than going, having to pack, go off package and uh, use wiring to move data from the processor to the memory, then we can put ev keep everything on the silicon substrate and move the data across this uh, silicon interposer. And uh, this is the sort of technology that's going to deliver maybe hundreds, several hundreds of gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth uh, from the uh, stack DRAM into the processor itself. So once we've then got that building block, so if we can perhaps get to something like 20 teraflops in a multi-chip module, we can then start assembling multiple of those modules into, um, our, um, into a cabinet, some sort of router connecting them up together, and if we've done everything right, and uh, the, the, the amount of power consumption varies from time to time as the architects think about it, but the expected goal is that we're going to be able to get to the exaflop range with this sort of concept uh, in about 20 megawatts of power consumption. And so, in conclusion, what I'd like to say is that uh, the future is about parallel computing. So GPUs are computers that are, are processors that are very parallel. And uh, as time progresses, what we're expecting to see is that um, graphics processors will become more and more the processor. So up until now, they've been acting as sort of attached coprocessors. They will become more autonomous. Uh, products that are coming onto the market uh, very soon will start on this path of making the GPU a more autonomous processor. We believe that it is a technology that can uh, offer the power uh, efficiency that can allow us to get to the exascale computing. We can get to exascale computing at the sort of power budget that people are expect hoping will be reasonable. So 20 megawatts is a typical power consumption that people are expecting. The GPU is going to become more autonomous, uh, more of the computer, you know, really become the computer rather than an attached coprocessor. But there is, of course, a topic that I've not talked about at all today, uh, and it's a topic that is uh, open, still open for plenty of work and plenty of research, which is how are we going to be able to manage to use these devices with such vast amounts of parallel, parallelism within them. So we can easily be thinking that there's going to be millions of threads executing on this um, um, uh, I'm, when I say millions, it may well be actually orders of magnitude more than that. I just can't quite think at the moment. But millions of threads, a million, large scale parallelism at extremely hard, high scale. How are we going to be able to manage these devices? How are we going to be able to program them and make, um, and make effective use of them? So programming these devices is perhaps a harder problem to solve than the, basic, you know, than the technological pro problem of how to make the machine. Just want to conclude with a little advertising for this, for using G, for GPU technology. So NVIDIA runs a, an annual conference every year. Um, so this year it will be in March. It's held in San Jose in California this year. Uh, we'd, I'd encourage any of you who are interested in GPU computing to attend and come and, uh, come and see what is the latest at GPU in GPU computing. 
I think last year we had something like 2,000 uh, attendees there. We'd be happy to see uh, any of you coming, uh, coming uh, to visit us in, in San Jose, in Silicon Valley, in, uh, in March. So that concludes my presentation. If there are questions, I'd be, uh, be happy to take them.